Okay, hello and welcome to this episode of Martial Arts Studies. And I'm talking to Gigi Chang, who is a translator of Jin Yong martial arts type novels. Hello, Gigi, how are you? Hello, I'm great. Thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you for taking the time um, and for being the time difference between us. We've worked it out. So yeah. <laughs> you're a translator and you're a translator of Jin Yong novels. Now, people who know Jin Yong know how enormous, it's, it's called the Jin Yong phenomenon, isn't it, really? So mm, tell, tell yeah. us, first of all, before we get to you, tell us a little bit about um, Jin Yong uh, novels and the, the author and, and the genre for people who don't know. Um, Jin Yong, well, he was born in 1924, um, and he he is a martial arts um, martial arts wuxia novel novelist. But to be honest, he's actually a businessman and a newspaper man more than a novelist. Though we only we we we, we know him best for his martial arts stories. Um, he started. Um, he's he always wanted to be a journalist and a politician and diplomat uh, a diplomat, um, but in the end um, fell into doing newspaper work, translating Newswire. I think in Shanghai in the nineteen forties, and that job moved him to Hong Kong. And over time, he became more embedded in the Hong Kong um, newspaper scene and founded his own Chinese language newspaper, Mingbao. And by finding a newspaper, he needs to find readers. And because he's always been interested in stories and martial arts, and at that time, he's already written a little bit of martial arts fiction. When he started his own newspaper, he also started serializing martial arts stories to pull in readership, because otherwise, you know, who buys your newspaper every day? There, there are so many competitors. So between 1955 to 1972, um, he, uh, serialized about 15 um, longer or shorter novels. The longer ones are about a million um, Chinese characters and the short ones were probably about sort of 80, 80 sort of 50, 50 to 80,000 Chinese characters. Okay. And essentially in those sort of 20 odd years, he was writing every day some form of martial arts stories on top of his role as chief editor to the newspaper uh, and mm -hmm. filling in anything else that needs need a filling in um, in the newspaper. So he was reviewing a lot of um, arts and cinema and he worked even a little bit as a script writer, mm -hmm. as a director. Um, he's like very, very involved in all kinds of creative um, social Mm. side of um of, of the of his newspaper yeah okay so how did you get into translating his work how did that happen how did you become a translator now i probably should add that um when jin young wrote his martial arts stories um they became hugely popular at the time and there were num numerous um screen film or adaptations when he was writing the stories. Mm -hmm. And as I grew up in Hong Kong, pretty much every sort of five to 10 years, the same novel will be adapted into a new generation of um, television show. And because he's written 15 stories, so within sort of every two or three years, you will find a new adaptation of Jin Yong TV series um, around you. Okay. And and so like you, he is in a way unavoidable <laughs> if you are growing up in Hong Kong, but in the best possible way, because his stories are great. They're always on TV, the um, and there are um, theme songs to these TV shows. So it's it's something that probably nearly every Chinese speaker that grew up sort of seven, especially from the eighties onwards, mm -hmm. um, would have known his work through TV and then re read his novel. So how I came to translate um, is also quite a roundabout story. I mean, I didn't set out to become um, a translator. Uh, I read art history in the UK. I, my first job was at the museum, but it was while I was working in the museum that I met Anna Homewood, who is the translator um, who, who, who was instru instrumental in um, finding, um, securing the English rights and finding a publisher in English for Legends of the Condor Heroes, which is the genial novel that I, I took part in translating. Yeah. Um, so because 
I, it was at that time, it was sort of early, mid 2000, uh, um, sort of 2005, around that time. And at the time, there were very few Chinese speakers that studied um, humanities. Okay. <laughs> and I was working on a Chinese exhibition in the UK. And inevitably, there's a lot of translation to be done in the in in, in my job. Mm -hmm. And when I moved back to Hong Kong, I was working in theatre, and um, because of Hong Kong's sort of ex-colonial um, uh, history, um, everything is expected to be bilingual. So again, I was needed to translate because I speak Chinese, I speak English, uh, both Cantonese and Mandarin. Mm -hmm. And sort of over time, my work went from sort of museum curating to writing and translation. At the same time, Anna Homewood, since since we met in 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 the UK, she's she she was also learning Chinese and she became a literary translator and a literary agent. So sort of several years on, our path cross again, and she asked me to do some um, translation for her to sell the board. Mm -hmm. to sell the uh, international rights and at the time she was also starting to translate legends of the condor heroes and as she worked on it she realized it is a very it is a project that's almost too big for one person okay. because the book itself is almost a million chinese characters yeah and an english novel particularly at the time this is sort of we're talking about so 2010 11 12 at the time other than Harry Potter being a popular book that's over 500 pages long, you don't really have a great deal of um, um, sort of mass selling pop fiction that is yeah. very, very long. I mean, if you think back to so 2000 and early 2010s, that decade, um, fantasy and sci-fi wasn't mainstream it was still at the back of the bookstore <laughs> you know we don't have George R. R. Martin and all that um so so and and and, and a normal novel at that time probably be about 80,000 to 10,000 words in English so even a translation in English would be shorter than a million you know maybe 30 percent shorter we're still talking each volume probably pushing 20,000 uh, 200,000 okay. English words um, and to to be able to keep pumping out the book <laughs> as, as, as a reasonable um, pace um, it, it's actually quite difficult for, quote, for one person yeah. to do it um, so Anna asked me if I wanted to join the project and of course I said yes I mean I grew up with genial yeah. TV TV series um, the theme songs and the novels why would you say no <laughs> <laughs> okay so so um what um so this is this is the martial arts studies podcast and Jin Yong yep. is, a, is a martial arts novelist so tell me uh, about let's let's talk about the fights and the training and the yep. martial arts stuff uh specifically and but thinking about translation generally I guess um mm. What what have been the major challenges? I mean, if it, what's the most what's been the most difficult thing to kind of go okay, so I kind of get that um, in the Chinese context, but how am I going to render that into a meaningful English form? <laughs> yeah, that is probably the biggest challenge. I think I say the first thing would be um, the first problem is actually myself as a translator or reader how I visualize it because I think as you write as an academic if you can't see something or you don't have it clear in your head mm -hmm. whatever you write is going to be a bit garbled <laughs> mm -hmm. um so the first thing as a read because if you're a reader you you kind of rip through the books yeah. and you don't have to picture everything very clearly you got an idea move to the next part yeah. um and and also because we all grew up watching some form of martial arts or action move, movie from you know Bruce Lee to Jet Li to Jackie Chan to Matrix or Star Wars all of it any Hollywood films there's there are fights you know we can all picture fighting mm. um, but when you're writing about fighting extensive amount of fighting I would say probably at least half of the novel is actual punching up of people <laughs> or, or, or sort of exchanging blows yeah. which in an English language sort of fiction tra um, tradition 
if you read even an action heavy book you probably get two major scenes in the climax that would be a fight that would be a blow to blow yeah. um kind of fight but whereas in martial arts chinese in, in martial arts fiction it is the fights that brings the story a lot yeah um so the first thing the first problem trouble is actually picturing them yeah um so one of sort of as research um i actually started taking um martial arts classes okay so what, i what did you take did you, did you... i i started doing tai chi okay. um um with our first shifu he very fortunately he's both a, a tai chi master at the same time he's also also a screenwriter okay <laughs> so it was really yeah. helpful so we can like talk about how Jin Yong fights and he sort of taught us the basics and then later on I also learned um uh Wu Dang uh, 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 from from a Wu Dang um Taoist monk okay so and who and so you kind of discovering through learning Kung Fu, um, Tai Chi or Chinese martial arts, that actually the language that Jin Yong writes in is the vocabulary used in Chinese martial arts. Okay. Because Chinese martial arts is such a long tradition um, in, in Chinese culture, be it sort of popular or written form. So it is not, it is not something that is separated from everyday life in the sense that if you read about um, Song Dynasty or sort of the entertainment in the Song Dynasty there are contemporary accounts from like a thousand years ago they would talk about people acrobatics or buskers um, that would be doing martial artsy things for mm -hmm. money on the streets um, or in um, sort of pleasure houses or entertainment venues yeah. and at the same time there is also traditional Chinese theatre Chinese opera which has this very strong um, performative elements and a lot of that those movement is uh, to do with Chinese martial arts and obviously there is also the um, religious aspect of Chinese martial arts related to Taoism and Buddhism like Shaolin and Wu, Wu Dang so mm. all of that has extensive um, both documentary as well as um, written content about what is going on and how you fight. So, so when you realize that the words that Jin Yong use aren't just any old um, action word, they are actual vocabulary that has a very specific movement to them. Yeah. Um, the the problem translating them into English is try to convey the same sense. Okay. Because in English, you don't have as sort of an, an embedded martial arts culture or fighting culture, really. You know, you have boxing, you have fencing, but that language, the boxing language and the fencing language or, or jousting language is not an everyday <laughs> part of, it's, it's, not a, everyone, it's, it's not our everyday vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, so... The, the, I guess the simple thing, because you, you, you also do martial arts and you do Chinese martial arts, so the, the sort of simple thing is um, there's something like toy push, which in martial arts there are very specific of what you're pushing against and with which body part you're pushing and how you channel your, your, your how, how, how you are not just fighting with your arms, but mostly actually from your legs and the shifting of your hip and shifting of your weight. Yeah. Or, or the very simple thing is another action is cow to lean and which you know in English to lean on something it sounds a bit flabby it's not hasn't got actually a lot of force but in Chinese martial arts speak to lean on someone is a very minute shift of your weight from one leg to another way uh, to, to one leg from one leg to another but that force is essentially leaning your whole body weight or pushing your whole or thrusting your whole body weight onto the next person and you can essentially bounce them off yeah. if you're good enough yeah. so so when you sort of realize all these sort of very simple almost everyday words actually contains such an explosive force yeah then in the translation you have to find a way in normal english because yeah. this is still a, a story i'm not talking like a 
martial arts sort of I still have to um, capture the speed and the excitement of the fight yeah. and you can't put in a whole lot of work so that people kind of will have to pause and think of what it means and and visualize it so so it's to balance the the impact of the actually very specific language Jin Yong use and to Chinese readers with the knowledge we know exactly what he's talking about to uh, an everyday language in English that hopefully have the same impact yeah. but then but, um, bringing together all the sort of requirements of fiction and excitement you know pace rhythm um, sort of color and speed okay and and because we all grew up watching fights on screen rather than you know that's all we know we don't we haven't actually got in english we don't have a great reading tradition of fights okay. so in a way i find that in english they will have to be actually a couple of notches more exciting okay. than chinese to get that excitement across because you're we're competing with you know special effects yeah, yeah, yeah sounds oh. and you know all singing and dancing <laughs> so i'm getting i'm getting two things so one is i mean I, when you're talking about having to think specifically about like really clearly visualize yeah. what's going on i mean my mem i studied english at university right yeah and so this that's my language right <laughs> so I, but even reading novels and especially poetry that's like 100 years old 150 yeah. years old for me to even me reading my supposedly my native language trying to make sense of what the bloody hell is going on but i didn't yes. have to i just had to get the sort of gist so there's some people and something happens and but then you go yeah. back a few hundred years you're trying to read shakespeare or you're trying to read further yeah. back and chaucer or something it's just like what the hell is going on but you're yeah. saying that as a so and in terms of like theories about reading, like the theory mm. about reading is that you, one of the theories is that you kind of get the gist of it. You you recognize certain generic convention, like yeah. once upon a time there was a beautiful princess, right? Okay, I know what I'm dealing with here, fairy story. But then you constantly have to revise and change as, as yep. you go through mm -hmm. the narrative, but you don't have that luxury. Like as a translator, you have to already have it and be completely... Yeah. Con convinced that your sense of this scene is exactly and this technique and this interaction of of opponents in this context that you yeah. nailed it so that it doesn't contradict anything later on yes. doesn't lose a sense that was there in the original text yeah and then also you're suggesting that without a working knowledge of say chinese martial arts in this context mm. and probably more than one like several different styles right yeah you're yeah. not really so someone who didn't know anything about someone who could speak Chinese but didn't know anything about Chinese martial arts couldn't really translate this stuff. They lose stuff. Well, I think there are different layers because I mean Jin Yong himself, I think he's very interested in martial arts. He probably re read widely about martial arts, but as far as I think the uh, sort of rumor on the street goes, he's not a fighter himself. Yeah. Um, whether it's taken lessons and any experience, we don't really know that much, but he's yeah. not a physical practitioner. Um, but I think it's as a reader, you probably get, depending how interested you are in fighting, you get different yeah. layers of it. But as a translator, I think you really do, if you don't start drilling down exactly what's going on, yeah. <laughs> you you can't portray it. Yeah. The book isn't just about the fights um, because all these shows, all these novels have been made into so many different TV shows and films. So we do have a lot of that kind of generic Kung Fu fighting from Crouching Tiger to Ashes of Time to Matrix and Star Wars, all of that stuff mm -hmm. you can pull in to feel, to, to, to enrich your imagination. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, a lot of the times, actually increasingly as I translate, I find the fight scenes harder and harder because when we started, maybe I, I see this much. Yeah. Now, because I got used to how he writes um, a fight scene, I'm seeing more and more issues um, or, or discovering more and more that um, what he's talking 
talking about or learn from my mistakes before what I haven't explained clearly enough, be it in my early draft or, yeah. or from feedbacks from um, editors or friends who've read different iterations of, 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 of my manuscripts. Yeah. And, and also, especially now that we have an audio book, so hearing the book and reading the book on paper is also quite different because listening is sequential. Whereas reading, though sequential, you can kind of, you kind of probably hold a little bit more information at one time. Yeah. Um, and I say, sort of in a way, I become sort of much more aware of spatially in a, working almost like a director and fight choreographer at the same time and a cameraman so the fight might only involve two people but there might be three or four characters in the room what are they doing at the time that they are not written about in the book you know do they just stand there and do nothing <laughs> or obviously they aren't so in a way it's almost like um sort of watching something on stage yeah. Two people might be talking, but there are still people wandering around in the background. What are they doing? Being aware of every sort of every single piece of be it person, characters, to mm -hmm. furniture, to lighting, to how big or small the room is. Um, and then with that, you select the information well, or you follow a genuine selection of the information and tell that part of the story while keeping everything else in mind so because if you forgot if you as a translator forgot have forgotten that they exist then readers will have forgotten that they existed yeah and then when they reappears again and everyone it will be a shock to everyone yeah. so it kind of almost like a, a really not at ball threat that you have to unpick okay. and then <laughs> and then put back into that <laughs> that form because okay. if you don't unpick it you don't know what's going on yeah so you've got it. You're comp you're writing all of the subtext and all of the other stuff. You're writing that in your brain. Um, yeah. So here's, I mean, if if um, the Hong Kong media and literary environment is always saturated or always um, features Jin Yong remakes and reimagining yeah. and different versions every few years, I mean, do you think that your the fact that you've been steeped in these different media versions? Tell, film and television versions of, of Jin Yong novels. Did that infuse your own uh, imagining of it? You know, like for instance, it, it, like in the British context, I think also popular in China would be like the recent, relatively recent versions of Sherlock Holmes, yeah. which completely reinvented Sherlock Holmes as this yeah. kind of really cool, edgy, danger, which is something that had been lost in in earlier versions. That that yeah. That, I mean, is there a more funky version that you've that you've accepted rather than maybe a more old fashioned, boring version that that um, you, know, you didn't like very much, or or is it or, or is this a completely unique um, kind of ren rendering of of the novel? I think sort of in my head, it's just a melting pot of fight scenes that I'm not too sure sort of that I've watched since I was a child. I can't. I mean majority of that I watched probably in in sort of my early teens in, in my secondary school years so I don't re remember specifically what's going on and I actively now avoid even looking at pictures okay. of new versions because I don't want them to affect my imagination of the characters because yeah. the book is actually quite different sometimes from the tv or screen adaptations yeah. but um period drama chinese period drama with some sort of martial arts or fantastical flying fighting element is very very common so it is it is very much part of your imagination yeah. it's impossible to cut it out of your your being in a way yeah yeah yeah. Okay. So how long does the so there's a team of you working on these the, the mm. huge text? Do you oh, two questions I've got about that? One is how long does it take? And do you ever disagree? Do you do you do you disagree about things? Like say you're the martial arts expert, right? Somebody else, another translator maybe doesn't know as much about you. Do you kind of go, no, but 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 it doesn't mean lean, it means it means smashing your weight in a very precise way into a very precise part of the body to to have this effect do you do you ever get into conversations like that or 
Um, I think it, well, the simple question is it, it takes, it took forever. I mean, the first part of the trilogy, Legends of the Hond Condor Hero, essentially from start to finish, four volumes, um, took about almost 10 years. Mm. So Anna started in 2000, I think 12. And the first book came out in 2018. I started in 2015 and I worked on uh, volume two, three and four. Um, and volume four, A Heart Divided, came out in, I think, 2021. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty much 10 years from, from, from the selling of the rights to her starting to translate to the last book when we finished the last book together. Um, and, I've, and I'm have and i now working on Return of the Condor Heroes, which is the next part of the tr trilogy. And it's been a while since I've, <laughs> I've been working on the first volume yeah. and um, should be finishing that soon. Um, as for disagreements, I think we disagree on things. I mean, generally with fights, by the time we see each other's work, we have worked out the logic of that scene internally. So there's not a lot of disagreement on that front because uh, by the time you're willing to show your draft to each other, you kind of, it's pretty much sort of completing. So you, do you each do but, a draft of the same section the same scene or do you have um we work on different sections and then we we and then we cross work and then we okay. send each other at work um but what we will disagree on is how Jin Yong writes about martial arts um uh, uh sort of martial arts menu how how he talks about how how he terms these probably um Taoist or Buddhist or, or other Chinese classics inspired phrases and how that kind of Chinese philosophy informs the actual moves. Okay. Because the action scenes tends to be quite um, self-contained. You, If you're translating it, you kind of make it works even though maybe there's some slight difference with what goes on in Chinese, but you know, as a sequence, it mm -hmm. is whole. But when he say he talks about the background to how a move works, that's much more and quoting Chinese classics in a way that's much more interpretive. Because if a Chinese reader reads it, you kind of look at a oh, classical text, your eyes probably glaze over and skip yes. to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Because you know, okay, quote quotes. These are like you don't need to know exactly what it's about. Yeah. So he's talking mysterious things that means that has deep meanings. Yeah. But in yeah. English, you have to translate it, and you yeah. have to convey that sort of mystique. At the yeah. same time, you have to relate it to the sort of martial arts moves or yeah. that he's actually talking about, which might divert from the academic meaning of those um, classical lines. Okay, so do you find that you retranslate the, the classics that are being quoted from, or do you find a version that you're happy with uh, and, and kind of use that, or, or is it, you know, we is... always retranslate them. So in the earlier drafts, we might we might pluck what we can find on the internet <laughs> and plug that in. But as we revise the um, the re um, the manuscript, they will always have to be rewritten to fit yeah. both the uh, the language style. So there's difference between normal prose and yeah. the um, classical quote. Yeah. At the same time, is to actually link it back to to the martial arts that's we've already spent pages and pages talking about because okay. these classical texts tends to be about sort of internal kung fu or the movement of energy within the body so or in modern day parlance will be the force as in yeah. star wars <laughs> <laughs> it's not that different from the force <laughs> so but but the way he quote these texts are really clever so he, he kind of picked bits of it that you will see whether you understand the original text or not that associates with the um the, the martial arts that he's talking about so he's sort of making that connection making them sound mystical at the same time understandable and different from everything else that the the, the sort of prose that i've been writing about 
there's okay. a multiple layer. Yeah. And so, I mean, so for for I guess for English language readers, as long as you're familiar with what Star Wars and The Matrix, you'd be able to get, uh, and maybe Crouching Tiger, you you'd be able to get into this, uh, and it will be like a genre that you might well like. Yeah, yeah, I think I say it's all if you like adventure stories and so big epics and don't mind reading one novel that takes four volumes to complete. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's definitely along the line of sort of fantasy or adventure epics and okay. and and even though it might sound a bit supernatural and a bit foreign, but actually, if you can accept, you know, aliens and elves and orcs and everything else, the world itself is very self, is self-contained and exp everything is explained with it. Okay. So yeah. whether whether the Chinese, classical Chinese content, the martial arts content, or or any sort of philosophical, religious, historical content, all that is explained. Okay, and here's a. a because a, a lot of sort of martial arts aficionados mm. listen to this stuff and is are there what specific styles if any are, are mentioned i mean is it generic like wushu or is it is it specific does he talk about wing chun or yong chun or Charlie foot or like you know anything like that i think at least the, with the legends of the condor heroes the, the trilogy is majority taoist based so yeah okay Wudan doesn't appear until the third part of the series and like Tai Chi and all that but majority of the moves were um were what we call internal martial arts yeah. they they are less Shaolin, Shaolin also mentioned in the third part of the series but less Shaolin sense as in you know you, you fight very fast and mm. fast and hard which I think when Wing Chun is also, but more about it is kind of slow, but has explosive power at contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so it's got that kind of that kind of Taoist aesthetic. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, and so um, is this? Are you on some kind of a retainer? Like you're you're now the one of the translators of all possible future English versions of Jin Yong novels or I mean how does that work? Oh god no I'm, I'm just doing this series. Is this right you for now. life now? Is this, is this your life sentence? It, it, it is already what seven years of my life so right so right now I'm working on the return of the Condor Heroes so that's going to be four volumes and so that's the next 10 years that's probably yeah the next sort of five or six years I guess <laughs> And and in theory, we should be working on um, the third part of the trilogy, which is ha um, um, Heaven Sab uh, Dragon Saber and Heaven Sword, Heaven Sword and Dragon Saber. Okay. Heaven Sword and, and it, Dragon it's Saber. not it's yeah. not like your full time job, is it? Right. It's, it is my full time job. Is it's majority of my this time is nine is working to five, on this. Five days a week translating. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, being a tran lit literary translator, um, sadly, it doesn't pay very well. <laughs> so you do have to take majority of literary translators out there in the world do take other work. But yeah. um, so I, I do a little bit of work um, on exhibitions, um, yeah. putting on or, or taking down exhibitions. Um, and, and I also work with a designer part time doing a little okay. bit of admin and sort of project managed work. Um, to supplement okay. the income, but but it, but the majority of the time, ninety percent of my time is is on um, translation. Does it, does it make you want to write martial arts fiction yourself? If given the <laughs> success of this, I mean, you know. um, probably not. Not right now. I just don't really have the time. Okay. It's essentially, <laughs> my waking hours is on translation or rewriting the translations. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And is this? Um, I mean, do. So you've got you've got Jin Yong for the next five years or so. I mean, is it something yeah. that you want to? Do you think that you? Well, it's hard to predict five years, isn't it? Right, but yeah, but is, is this is this something that you see for life? I mean, it must be work that you love, right? Just well, I really enjoyed it, and I'm happy. I happily do it if there's more work to be done, um, because there are you know there are only that many Chinese folks that get translated into English every year. 
you know, okay. getting a book is not so easy as a translator. <laughs> okay. And is it is it something that you, because um, I mean, there's an increasing amount of English language scholarship about Chinese martial arts fiction and Jin Yong features mm. highly in some of it. Yeah. I mean, is it, uh, are you also a, a Jin Yong commentator? Do you, you know, do you see yourself um, writing about Jin Yong, lecturing? I wouldn't pretend to have enough knowledge to do that because I think you've right, seen because, have quite a lot of knowledge about but it. I but my knowledge of Jin Yong and his book is actually very narrow on the specific books I'm working on because we I've spent so much time with them yeah whereas the rest of the his novels or his works you know I've only read them as the uh, sort of average reader okay. it wasn't that deep that that level of an engagement and even when I'm reading his other works you don't engage it as deeply as you're translating yeah but I mean this sounds like a level of modesty that is unacceptable to me <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like if I've read a few books by someone I'm like yeah I know all about them I'm an expert I can write about them but you know you've lived and breathed these books I'm not I'm not asking you to to do anything different with your life I just wonder um you know if you've to what extent you're to what extent you are completely immersed in, in this work or to what extent you might um, kind of branch out and commentate or do, do other things around that. And your museum work around that is, is, is that, because that was your first blog, right? That was your first. Yes. Yeah, so that was my first job. Um, I worked for the v and Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And so yeah. now I do a little bit of work with them when they have to exhibition and tour in China, hmm. partly because um, the Chinese border is still um, not entirely open to international visitors so when a show came someone got to look after the objects and so, so I do that every so often <laughs> yeah okay well I'm gonna um, say thank you very much for taking this time to to talk to me today um, it's been really really interesting um, yeah. yeah absolutely fascinating um, I, I do actually I own some Jin Yong novels on my Kindle uh, I, I own the first version, the first uh, edition, I think, but um, I, I haven't quite finished it. I'm not really the kind of person who can read a million words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is very long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it should be quite fun. So once you get into it, hopefully yeah. the pages will fly by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking, what about if there are um, kind of adaptations, uh, you know, like cinematic adaptations into into English, eh? like into the Hollywood kind of cinematic universe. I mean, would you be involved in that? I mean, you probably want to be, right? But I want to be, but I don't know whether they would let me. Well, <laughs> I, I hope great. that um, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope that happens. I hope that would be cool, wouldn't it? But um, yeah. okay, Gigi, thank you so much for taking yeah. the time. Um, yeah. Really Thanks enjoyable. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, speak soon. Okay. Bye.